This is how we renew our strength. This is how we renew our strength. Fresh fire is coming upon you. Lord, as I pray in the Holy Ghost, I receive fresh fire. I receive fresh anointing. I receive fresh revelation. Somebody, as you pray in the Holy Ghost, realize that you're receiving a fresh anointing. You are receiving fresh strength. You are receiving fresh revelation. Fresh fire from above Oh yes, manda brose prekata rada bosata, manda broso di garasha da bahata, manda rada usa pre manda rada bazata. Praying in tongues is one of the ways to download divine inspirations. This is how you receive supernatural insights, prophetic insights. Receive prophetic insights as you pray in the Holy Ghost. My Father, my Maker, as I pray in the Holy Ghost. I receive fresh insights, prophetic insights for my life and destiny and for my generation in the name of Jesus. No shada bahate prosida bahanda riga da barasa da baranda da bazata. This is the place of rest. Isaiah 28 12, the Berean Bible says, To whom he has said, This is the place of rest. Let the, weary, let the weary rest. This is the place of repose. So as you come into the presence of God and as you pray in the Holy Ghost, it is the place of rest. It is a rest of victory. May the Lord grant you the rest of victory over all that has been fighting you. The rest of victory over your enemies over the enemies of your destiny as you pray in the Holy Ghost. If I'm to read from again that scripture to you, Isaiah 28 from verse 11, the Berean study Bible says, Indeed, with, a foreign, with foreign tongues, he will speak to his people. With the strange lips and with another tongue, he will speak to his people. That's what the American Standard Version says. And 12 says, To whom he said, This is the rest. Give ye rest to him that is weary. And this is the refreshing. This is the refreshing. So as you join us, those of you who are joining us live online, you're welcome. And those of you that have just joined us here in the church, you're welcome. So all I want you to do is to begin right now to say that, Lord, as I pray in my heavenly language, I receive refreshment. I receive refreshment in the name of Jesus. This is the refreshing hour. Lord, I come into your presence. Refresh me by the power of your Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus Christ as I wait in this place Lord renew my strength for you renew my love for you renew my love for the word of God increase my hunger for you increase my hunger for the things of God increase my passion and hunger for prayer in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ come on somebody Maja de prosi premanto ubreganta da baha Beatrice, you're welcome. Brase de Bahata, je de promanta ro u se prega dombra da zadata, i je de promanta ri u se preganta ri barom bredasa, rekisha da baranto brezanta i jo prega zo precaso premanta di barom bredesa da gata, je de prosuta ma ombro di zanda radosha, je de brosa premanta ra u se prega nombra, radose pre canto ro u se premanta u se diga maradosa premanta radasso re isce de bahata ma ja de prosso premanta u se premanta u cadaga u rebasa premanta u se premanta ridosa je de prosa premanta u premanta je cusu prima umbra da zate de u se de ba za promanta radasa kia da baranda redosse de bo shada bacando Ribahata, Jedebosa Karadasa Kado Bremanta, 
Radose premanto use premanta carodesa Redosa premanda radosi cada uche de bahanda Manda radabosa premanda radabose premanda Radabasata cada burra dambro di sadabarandi Uche de brosute premanda radabose premanda Regge de bosha da barando di bause premanda Reso coia da baranda radabosa da bahata O sapremanda rado se brega Manda rado se premanta ze gorezo premanda rado shata Manda brozuta rada shada bahanda Open up your mouth and say blessed the Holy Spirit My life is available in Jesus name King of kings and Lord of lords My life is available for you Jehovah God I give you earthly permission Invade every chamber of my life in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mashada bara supremanda ra upreka manda ra do supremanda ra da bo supremanda ra ogeda masha bro suprema de brozita ra ambrada manda ra do supremanta kupremanda ra da umbreda nazaga ya da barando presade bahata mando presuda baranto usha prekanto ribaka na za prepo supremanta prauda marado supremanda ra da basa Manda, maga pro se premanta umbra da zanda, mijedombra supre use kia da bahanda, mande brosuta, desire his presence today, desire his presence today. Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom, is the kingdom of heaven. You must command the spiritual poverty, you must desire God. Spiritual poverty expresses your need. Your your need for God, your need for his presence. You are saying that Lord without you I cannot live another moment. I can't live another second. I need you more than yesterday. Unless you touch me my life cannot make sense Lord. Unless you touch my life Lord unless you give me a remarkable encounter my life is meaningless without you. So I need you more than yesterday. Blessed that the poor in spirit. Jesus said theirs is the kingdom. The kingdom belongs to those who are poor in spirit towards God. He didn't say poor in life. He says poor in spirit. Those are the people that have a great hunger, a great appetite for God. They're saying, Lord, unless you satisfy me, silver and gold and money can't satisfy me. Makade broso di bahanda radasa, nasha premanta daba. Mande broso di garasa premando di hata. Mande broso preka daba rando di bahata. Manda nothing else satisfies but his presence. Manda broso preka. Andora hadibasha ida bosa premanta uche de bahata. So I call you out as you begin to express your hunger and desire for God. Come on, somebody, somebody begin to desire. Zede brosa premanta kusha da bahande. Zede prosuta rada bahanda rada bazata. Redo sapremanda rada bazanda rada bashata. Rede basaka ya da barande rede busha da bahata. Jene mombro de sada baranda rada basata. The Bible says in Psalms chapter 27 and verse 4 a quote. One thing have I asked of the Lord. That will I seek. Inquire for and insistently, insistently require that I may dwell in the house of the Lord in his presence all the days of my life to behold and gaze upon the beauty, the sweet attractiveness and delightful loveliness of the Lord to meditate, consider and inquire in his temple. Much more than that, when you look at that Psalm, verse 8, chapter 27, Psalms 27, 8, I'm reading from the Amplified Classic. Verse 8 says this, You have said, 
the psalmist is saying you have said seek my face which means inquire for and require my presence as your vital need it says you have said seek my face what does it mean to seek the face it means to inquire for and require the presence of the Lord as your vital need then he goes on to say my heart says to you this evening I want your heart to speak like David is saying let our heart say the same way David said he said my heart says to you your face which is your presence Lord will I seek will I inquire for and require of necessity and on the authority of your word so as you come into the presence of the Lord you must desire this is what it means to seek the face of the Lord is to inquire and require for his presence as your vital need you must have a realization that your presence is my vital need a vital need differs from a want a need is something that you cannot live without vital need like your breath vital as your breath without your breath you can't live another moment, another minute. So you must come with this um, attitude before the presence of the Lord. The woman who taught me in my early teens used to say, as you pray, pray, seek the presence of the Lord like it's your last minute to leave. Pray like your life depended on it because it depends on it. And she used to say, as you come before the Lord, pray and say to die or to meet his presence. And she said, when you seek him with all your heart, he will be fond of you. He will be found of you. You see, the Bible says, there's a lot of people that read Jeremiah 33. But we should understand that the Lord commands us to seek him with all our hearts. If you seek me diligently, if you seek me with everything in you, if you require of my presence as your vital need and necessity, as of necessity and of your vital need, he says, I'll be fond of you. Now, one of the ways in finding God is to eliminate or do away with the things that hinder us to see his presence. So as we are seeking him this evening, I call you now and I want you to look at Matthew chapter 5 and 8. Jesus told us, blessed are the pure in a heart. They shall see God, not in eternity, in eternity you're going to be with him he's talking about while you're still here on earth you will see god work for you i don't know how many people that want god to see god move in their situations i want god to move into my situation and if you are that person that say i want god to move into my circumstances into my situation i want god to invade my life then you are the right person I'm talking about. Jesus said, blessed are the pure in a heart, they shall see God. And Matthew 13 tells us of the parable of the sower who went out to sow and he sowed the seeds. But the problem was not the seeds, it was the ground that was receiving the seeds. And the Bible says that some seeds fell on dry ground thorny grounds but however there are seeds that fell on the good ground and the disciples came and asked the master what does this parable mean and he told them the sower is the master himself the seeds are the word of God and the heart the garden 
or the field is the heart. So you can see that the seed of the word of God, the word of God is so powerful. The Bible says that all things will pass away, but not the word of God. The Bible tells us that the heavens and the earth, the heavens are sustained by without a pillar, but by the power of the word of God. So the word of God is the pillar that sustains the heavens. The word of God is the pathway or the gateway to the wonders of God, to the power of God. Yet I want you to understand that when this word is sown in our hearts, the soil of our hearts, when the garden of our hearts, when the garden of our hearts are contaminated or is contaminated, then the word will not find expression. The word becomes nullified. So Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, Blessed are the pure in heart, they shall see God. They shall encounter God. I want to tell you something. When men and women encounter God, their lives can never remain the same. Paul the Apostle, a murderer of the church, on his way to Damascus, he encountered Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. And a murderer became an apostle. Moses, another murderer, was fleeing Egypt after having killed an Egyptian. After 40 years behind the deserts, he met, he had an encounter with Jehovah God. And you know what happened? Moses became a murderer, was transformed into a deliverer. Just as a murderer's soul was converted and translated into an apostle and a soul winner and a writer of the three quarters of the New Testament, Paul the Apostle. How about timid or how about struggling fishermen who were struggling to catch fish, but fish was rebellious to them. They couldn't catch fish. They were trying to to make ends meet but nothing was coming forth there were strugglers Peter and his company when they encountered Jesus he told them follow me I'll make you fishers of men today we talk about ordinary men who became extraordinary because they had an encounter with the extra Every ordinary lifestyle, once it, had, once it gets an encounter with the extraordinary, becomes an extraordinary life. This man who was an ordinary fisherman, his shadow, by reason of the person of Christ he encountered, his shadow began to heal. Whilst he's passing in the marketplaces, people would often bring their sick and lay them on the street so that the shadow of Peter, as he passes by, would fall on them. And they are sick who are healed without a man opening a word. I mean his mouth or saying a word. This same ordinary man because he had encountered Jesus. Do you know what happened? This man spoke to a man who had been lame, crippled for all his life. All his life almost like 40 years. And he laid hands on him. And he became whole because he had an encounter with Jesus Christ. How about Elizabeth, a barren woman, past childbearing age in her menopause? When she encountered the Lord, she conceived and gave birth to a prophet, John the Baptist, the greatest of all prophets. According to Jesus' um, 
statement. So, we can see that ordinary men and women become extraordinary once they encounter this God. Do you desire to live a life a Christian life that is super, beyond a superficial Christian lifestyle? Do you want to live an authentic Christian life rather than a superficial Christian life? Do you, are you tired of religiosity? Because to many Christianity has become religion. It's your religion. Religion is the things you do without revelation that carry no power so as you come in today to pray you must desire to have an encounter with God and it begins with the positioning of your heart it begins what's the heart the heart in the Bible denotes your conduct your character your attitudes and behavior so the Bible has said blessed are the pure in a heart so the purity of a heart is what determines the encounters man has with God. Jesus is telling us. So as you come in and remember, Jesus says as well, that when the sower had sown good seeds, people went to sleep. And whilst they were asleep, many go to sleep, actually spiritual slumber. And as many go into that sleep, the enemy comes and plants other things into the soil of your heart, the garden of your heart. What has the enemy planted in your heart lately? Is it bitterness? Is it anger? Is it hatred? Is it unforgiveness? Is it lust? Sexual lust? Lust for power? Lust for the money? the lust of the world, the pride of life. What is it that is eating away your heart? Is it self-praise? Is it arrogance? Is it your ego? What is it? That's when you do a reality check of where you're standing. Because it is these defects of the heart that hinder us to have an encounter with God. So as you come in today, Jesus said, blessed are the poor, I'm uh, sorry, blessed are the pure in a heart. He uses a, a, a very, um, he uses a, a powerful word that is worth consideration. Blessed, a Greek word, makarios. That word makarios means in favor with God is the pure in a heart. Favor is not what you get money to sow and to get favor. You can sow all you want, but if you are not, your heart is not pure, you can't provoke the favor of God upon you by manipulating or sacrificing your way into purity. Jesus says, blessed or in favor with God are the pure in a heart. So you can sow somebody sow a thousand a seed of a thousand uh, pounds so that you can have favor. Call that envelope favor envelope. That is that's a deception. That's a lie from the pits of hell. You cannot manipulate God's favor by reason of your money. But God says, blessed are the pure in a heart. In a favor with God are the pure in a heart. So I want you to understand that as you are going to pray with me, the prayers we are going to pray, I want to point you to the book of, um, I want to bring you to the book of uh, Jeremiah 17 to show you why you need to pray these prayers that we are about to pray. Jeremiah 17 Chapter 17, verse 9, it speaks like this. The heart is deceitful above all things, and it is exceedingly perverse and corrupt and severely mortally sick. 
who can know it, perceive and understand it, or be acquainted, who can be acquainted with his own heart? Hmm. Hmm. He says in verse 10, I the Lord search the mind and I try the heart. God tries, it says, I try the heart. There is a comma. Deuteronomy chapter 8 tells me that God led the children of Israel in the desert for 40 years. Deuteronomy 8, 2, 3 to 4, 5. It goes like this. It says, the whole commandment that I command you today, you shall be careful to do. That you may live. What? That you may live and multiply. It is God's desire for you and I to live, not to exist. To, to live is to fulfill your potential, the reason for your creation. He said that you will live and multiply. It is God's desire for every child of his to increase and multiply. But I want you to understand desire without pursuit of the pr principles that bring about your desire is approaching life backwards. So he says, you shall be careful to do. That is practicing. We should be careful to do. That we may live and multiply and go in and possess the land that the Lord sowed to our forefathers. Now pay attention. I've read you Jeremiah. God says, I try the heart. He says, I search the mind and try the heart. God searches the mind, the motives, and he tries the heart. And we want to see how he tries it. Verse 2 of Deuteronomy 8 says, And you shall remember the whole way, the whole journey. It was meant to be a 10 days journey. 11 days journey ended up being a 40 days journey. Why? A stubborn heart is responsible is responsible for prolonging the journey. There's a lot of people whose journeys right now, their deserts are prolonged. A place where you are meant to stay, to be tried or to go through temporarily has become your permanent dwelling place. Not because of God and not because of the devil. Because you have re refused to adjust. You have refused to comply. He says, you shall remember the whole way or the whole journey that, that the Lord your God has led you, not the devil, the Lord has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, comma. Why? He then he tells you that he might humble you, testing you to know what is in your heart. He led them that journey to humble them to test them to know what was in their hearts. It's not that the omniscient God did not know what was in the hearts of the Israelites, but God allows this kind or permits this kind of trials and the wilderness desert experiences to bring us to, to, to the attention of our own hearts. To bring us to a standstill, to pay attention to the state of our hearts. Today as we come in before God, what is the state of your heart? You see, God says, I led you in the desert. I wanted to humble you. And he says in verse 3, and, I, and he humbled you. How did God humble them? By, it says, by letting you hunger and fed you with manna. I permitted a hunger. I permitted luck. The essence of a hunger is not to destroy. When God permits lack, it is to humble the soul of a man. My mentor, Apostle Richard Mayanja, says, when God wants to, when God wants to judge a nation, he touches the economy of the nation. And when God wants to humble or judge a man, he touches his own children. And that's when even, you know, stubborn Pharaoh could not pay, could not heed the release of the Jews until God killed the firstborn son who was next in line. That's when he said, 
get out of here. Even the Egyptian says, let these people leave us alone. After they had lost, the Bible says there wasn't no house where in Egypt where there wasn't heard a cry except in Goshen where the Israelites were. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So God, he can permit hunger to humble us. Because why does God want you to humble yourself and me a humble heart? Because it is through our humility that God exalts us. It is through a humble heart that favor is attracted. The Bible says in James, God gives more grace to the humble. There is saving grace, but there is also functional grace. The saving grace a believer has nothing, does nothing except to, to believe and trust what God has done for him in Christ. But the grace to promote you, the grace, the functional grace is, a, is based upon your obedience. He says, God gives more grace to the humble, but he opposes the arrogant. More grace, he and God gives more grace to the humble. God lifts up the humble. Peter says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you in due season. It is God's tendency of lifting up those that are humble. So as you come into the presence of the Lord and as you're listening to me attentively, it's not that God is against you. God wants you. He wants to exalt you. You see, the devil was humbled when he exalted himself. So when man refuses to go the way of the devil by humbling himself, then God will exalt that man. So here God is saying, I caused you in Deuteronomy 8.3. I caused you, actually, yeah, I fed you, I let you, I humbled you and let you hunger. I let you hunger. I permitted you to hunger. Are you hearing this? Because I wanted to humble you. You see, God is a humble God. You see, it, humility is the nature of our heavenly father. I was told of a man who uh, had a vision and in this encounter, he went to heaven. And as he went to heaven, he saw the arrival of other, of other saints. I don't know if it was this uh, prophet Rick Joyner who wrote that in his book, The, Qu the Quest. And uh, while he was in heaven, he saw other arrivals and they were celebrated by the angels and uh, coming in and Jesus was seated on his throne, smiling as they came in, angels applauding. And there was this particular saint who came in with a different glorified garment. And as he walked in, as he stepped into eternity, that he had died, of course, on earth. And he now those new arrivals. As he arrived, Jesus stood from his throne and he came smiling to meet him. And all the angels were applauding differently the way they are applauding the arrival of this saint. And Jesus came and shook his hand and hugged them. Then the man of God who had encounter, who had arrived in heaven, asked the angel, who is this one? How come all the rest who are coming in, the angels were not standing and they were, and Jesus could not, was not standing, but he stood for this one and he came to greet him. And the angel told him, don't you understand the garment he's wearing? He's wearing the most respected garment here in heaven. And they told him, which one is that? He told him, he's wearing the garment of humility. So the garment of humility caused Jesus to leave the throne to go and welcome him. So can you imagine, humility attracts God. It is humility. A humble heart attracts favor. You can't sow your way into favor when you don't have humility. You can't substitute seeds for character. Your seed can't buy you favor, can't buy you humility. 
So this is why I'm saying that when we get to pray, you need to pay, ad give adequate attention to the state of your heart. And the Bible says God allows all. You see, the heart, the Bible tells us in, in uh, Ezekiel 16, talks about, talks about a stony heart as opposed to the heart of flesh. So every child of God who is born again has two hearts. There is the heart of flesh and the heart of stone. That's why God says, but I'll give you a new heart. That is the heart, the new heart, the Christ-like nature. A heart of flesh. And I'll take away the stony heart, God says. Now you need to understand the metaphors that God is using here to depict the two hearts. The heart of flesh is the heart that is that is controlled under the lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the spirit-filled heart. It's the obedient heart. To be spirit-filled is not to speak in tongues. It to be spirit-filled is to be obedient Christian. There is a misconception with today's generation that is predominantly focused on gifts and they think praying in tongues now I am that is what it means to be spirit filled but to be spirit filled means to be obedient Christian it is the level of our sanctification that determines <laughs> our maturity so here the two hearts, the stony heart. Why does God say the stony? You see, the stone as a hard mineral normally has to be compacted and compressed by a hard metal to crush it. That's why a stony heart invites hostile environments. It has God has to schedule and permit things and the circumstances and challenges of life to compact and compress this heart of stone to be crushed to become the heart of flesh so whilst we go through challenges God says here in Deuteronomy 8 I humbled you and let you hang and fed you with manna what does that mean God fed you with something that you don't know manna means what is this what's this is there anybody watching me or listening to me that has asked himself, what is this? What am I going through? Why this? I don't understand. Man, what is this means? A circumstance you don't understand. Something unfamiliar. Something you have never encountered before. What's this? Manna. He fed them with manna. Manna is a word which means what's this? I believe all of us have had our manner moments where we ask God, what's this? You look at your finances and say, what's this? You look at your relationship and say, what's this? You look at your marriage, what's this? You look at your ministry or business, what's this? You look at your nation and say, what's this? Manner. The manner situation where you come to an unfamiliar territory unfamiliar circumstances in your life but God allows a strange and unfamiliar I said he allows he permits them he does not commission them he permits them he allows them just as he allowed the contest between between himself and the devil for the heart of Job and he says all right I allow you go but you don't have you don't have his life you are not permitted to take his life. So we see whatever the devil was trying to do is try to send a point thinking Job will deny God. But Job, as we have read Psalms 27 in verse 8, and this man said, when you said, seek my face, my heart said of you, Lord, your face, which is your presence, that I will require, I will seek and inquire and require your presence as and as my vital need so we see that job had put job highly esteemed the presence of the lord as his necessity and vital need for life it's not the riches and the wealth it is god's presence that he desired and we see for that reason 
the devil failed. But my point was, God permits challenges of life for our sanctification. The word sanctification means a separation, means a purification. So when God says, blessed are the pure in a heart, you need to see this. Blessed, Jesus says, Matthew 5, 8, blessed are the pure in a heart. They shall see God. What does that mean? So when God permits you on the journey of purification of the heart, sanctification of the heart, it's not for you. It's not that God hates you. He doesn't love you. Now he's up, he's, he has picked up a big stick running after you because of what you did two years ago and God is punishing you. That's not what he's doing. He has permitted those challenges to sanctify you. Sanctification means a purification. Means washing your heart. He's trying to transform you into his likeness. So blessed are the pure. You see, pure hearts. You can't sow money to get a pure heart. Are you hearing me? A pure heart must be washed. Do you agree with me? Purified. It has to go through a purification process. Certain things or certain um, ingredients require fire for their purification. Based on the substance, isn't it? Based on your make. If you are gold, you need fire. If you are silver, you need a crucible, isn't it? So, God knows... If you're a stone or metal, you're going to be sharpened. And that sharpening process is not to your destruction. It is to your making. But once we have this understanding that he purifies my heart so that I can at the end of the day have an encounter with him. Are you hearing me? Then once you go through the challenges of life, you're not going to get mad. You're going to say, Lord, I'm available. Lord, here I am. Whatever you're doing with me. That's why James understood this. And he said, in James 1, 2, Consider it pure joy, brethren, when you face trials of various kinds, because they're testing of your faith. That is the, you see, <laughs> that's, in other versions, they'll call it the testing of your faith. It's, it talks about faith development. The development of your faith produces perseverance so God allows you to go through the development stage or process of life the development of your faith once your faith has been developed has matured has has been tested and proven it begins to work wonders praise the name of the Lord that's why it says consider it pure joy not sorrow why you know that God has permitted this to sanctify me the name of the Lord be, be, be praised. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So here, what are, why are all these challenges? Why are all these things? Because God says, I can permit these things. You know the problem is this we have. I want to I take you back to open your Bibles in Amplified Classic if you want because it breaks it down very well. Jeremiah 17, 9. Do you know? Why am I going to quote it for you? Because of this. Now, most of us, because our hearts lie to us, are you hearing me? Your heart can delay or postpone your purification, your sanctification. Why? Because it deceives you. How? You say, but Lord, I'm already ready. How long am I going to be tested? You hear that? How long am I going to be tested? I've been tested one year, two years. What kind of testing is this? You are, trying to tell, you are trying to tell us or tell God, Lord, as far as I'm concerned, I know my heart is ready. There's nothing wrong with it. You, so you are unfairly allowing me, permitting these challenges to come my way. Now, that is the very attitude God wants to deal with. You begin to question his authority rather than to look into the state of your heart. Brothers and sisters, the reason I read you Deuteronomy 8 was to tell you that he says here in Jeremiah uh, 17, um, 
17 10 it says i the lord search the mind and i try the heart so we wanted to see how does god try the heart he's the try of your heart remember the heart is not that thing that is pumping blood in you the heart here refers to your conduct your character your behavior and your attitude when god is testing your attitude he's going to bring other people God can cause you, you know, you are in a prominent position. He brings somebody in an inf a position you perceive to be inferior or younger than you and then is the one ordering you around. And God is testing your attitude. And the test of attitude is the test of the heart, whether you qualify for the encounters you so desire. I want you to understand that it's not how, how much you weep and beg him to reveal his face that it has to take too much weeping <laughs> you must tell me up there. <laughs> that it's not how much you flinch you know and you know or you it's not how much you cringe that will impress him to show you no it is indicated in your attitude towards changing the things he doesn't like. That's how you seek him. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So you see, I try the heart. God is trying attitudes. How is your behavior? Some people think, no, but I remember back in the days when I first came to the Lord, there are people I didn't want to greet. I used to think, like, well, that one, I came in the church, I'm thinking that one is a low class. I can't talk to that one. And they would come, and there are people I would intentionally greet me and I give them one finger. This one, like this. Didn't want to give them my hand, just one. So God had to deal with this guy, you see. So while I ate from the garbage cans, while I was running off, there were seasons, you know. Now God is breaking me. My, the, the, my fellow schoolmates, my schoolmates, and now that I'm, I even... I'm trying to survive. I don't have, even I'm homeless. I'm selling milk by the roadside. I don't want them to know I'm not going to school. I'm selling milk by the roadside. So whenever I used to see them when I'm, whilst I was standing beside my table with milk and bread, I would step away and stay, like walk around as if, no, that's not my table. But you know how God to humble you? The time I step away, that's when another customer, one of my customers comes driving and he parks and says, Moses, are you not going to give me milk? Now, I can't lose a customer who takes a, a, about 15 liters or 20 liters and because um, then I have to swallow my pride and pick up the milk and then my friends from school, say, they come, hey, well, you don't go to school anymore, you're doing this. Why? So I had to swallow my pride and accept at that point I'm selling milk. Why? God was breaking that self-importance in me. Are you hearing me? That's why there is no person, including my children, that I cannot apologize to when I'm wrong. And there are those that think your title <laughs> is too important to apologize when you're wrong. That means God, you know, you need that you, a desert is waiting for you. Do you understand what I'm saying? So this desert is not that God is mad, is, 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 is he's acting like a ferocious beast. No. <laughs> we are the ones who can prolong the process or determine to shorten the process. Do you understand where I'm coming from? It says, I try the heart. Okay, can we read our Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10 before you break forth into prayer? And I know you're going to break forth and you're going to talk to God. And I believe this month of May, we are going to experience more encounters in Jesus' name. We want this month of May to give focus and precedence upon the state of our hearts. Amen. Be conscious. You see, God says, I try the hearts of men. How many of you have read a proverb that says, iron sharpens iron? 
so a man sharpens another man. It is God's tendency to bring big-headed people, stubborn people around you, mean people around you to test, to try your heart. Do you understand me? People, unreasonable people. You see when you say, Lord, increase my love for you. Do you know what God does? God brings people that are so difficult to love to prove your love. I don't think you heard me. When you say, God, increase my love for you. Increase my love for you. The love of God, your love for God can only be discerned and approved by your love for, for his people. So when you say, out of the abundance of the, and the outflow of the love of God in your heart is revealed by how you treat those around you. Because we can tell how vertically you are affected by how you relate horizontally. Hmm? That's why James 1 John, I mean 1 John, the Bible says, how can you claim to love God whom you don't see when you fail to love your brother whom you know? I mean, you see. It means you are a liar. So you can see what I'm trying to tell you here. That the Bible has said their heart is deceitful. Children of God, are you listening to me? Their heart is what? Now, this is the creator of the heart telling you the heart of man is what? Deceitful. Can I give you a prayer point? Based on that, you and me constantly need to come to the gardener of our hearts. Remember what Jesus says in Matthew 13? He talks to us about the heart. Somebody say the heart. The soil and the seed. The soil, the heart, the seed, the word of God. The word of God to have an impact. The ground of the heart must be effectively prepared. If I'm talking to somebody who understands me, somebody say, I hear you. Now, Jeremiah, can we read? He says, the heart is deceitful above all. Above all what? above all things in other words you see the bible that's why the bible has said to you in proverbs 4 23 above all else guard your feet yeah what did he say to god guard your money right above all else guard your husband guard your marriage above all else what did he say to god guard your heart because when a man guards his heart, he has guarded his family. When a man guards his heart, he, are you hearing me? When a man guards his heart, listen, Satan could not take Job out because Job guarded the heart. He did, he, he, and guess what? And after he had messed up with everything that Job had, because the heart was not touched, Job received the double to what the devil had destroyed. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So the Bible says, above all else, guard the heart. Why? Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things. You see, you can overcome the deception that other people tell you. It is easy to see and to filter through the deceptions of other men you are able to tell the deceptions of the devil but the highest level of deception is personal deception and it is not easy to detect because we rationalize many times we rationalize to justify that deception inner deception i'm okay they were the ones who are the they were the ones in the wrong uh, I, I think they, they are the ones who misunderstood me. I am the one who is understanding here. Are you hearing me? The heart will tell you, you can't apologize. You can't humble yourself to such a man like that, to such a woman. You know, you know too much to humble yourself. You, you earn a lot to listen to such a fella. I sat somewhere and I heard two believers talking. 
and they were deep in a conversation, one believer told the other, there are certain churches I, uh, and certain men of God that can never speak to me. I first of all look at what car, how much money he earns before he even I th can qualify to preach to me. I kept, I listened and I said, hmm, wow. These ones, even Jesus could not be able to minister to them. Jesus could not have, didn't have a donkey. Not the, the, the car of the time, not even a horse. Even he had to borrow the one that took him to Jerusalem. So Jesus couldn't speak to these two fellas. You see ignorance. The heart has deceived them. Are you hearing me? John the Baptist could not have preached to these ones. The one Jesus calls great. He says, among those born of men, John the Baptist was what? He, that one. Jesus calls a man the greatest. Who didn't, he didn't own a plot. He didn't own a house. The guy had no address. He was living in the desert eating what? Locusts, honey, and he, he didn't even afford he had skin what? Goat skins? Let me stop there for a minute. Do you know that John the Baptist was smelly? Now you're going to ask, how did I know? Do you know my father, my grandfather had cows, goats and all that and sheep. When they slaughtered goats and skinned them and they put those skin, skin hides on the sun. And then some of them, by reason of the rain, comes instantly and they get wet. Hmm? Hmm. Do you know how they smell? Now, this guy was standing in the Jordan baptizing people with the skinny, because he was dressed in skin hides. Do you know how smelly it, they are now when water touches them? So, it took humility men in their caliber and their personal reputation to humble yourself to come to a stinking man to baptize you you see pride has actually denied many people their miracles and access that was due to them john the baptist such a man was a forerunner and a pointer a ma jesus needed john the jesus himself is the anointing but needed a man to point him out in terms of his ministry he needed a pointer but the pointer was smelly are you listening to what i'm saying the beginning point to having to encountering god is to give adequate attention to the state of your heart the state of our hearts revival begins with adequate attention given to the state of a believer's heart because revival is not when we fall down most of us have mis uh, mistaken the effects of a revival to being a revival or i should say, rather say like this we've mistaken the gifts of the holy spirit in manifestation for a revival Are you hearing me people fell demons cried the sick were healed and we call that a revival miracles do not mean a revival is in in the midst of you miracles simply means the kingdom of god is in our midst isn't it a revival on the other hand is a renewed conviction a renewed what conviction of sin followed by a strong desire to live in obedience with the word of God minus falling down minus these other happenings are you hearing me a renewed a fresh conviction that when you lie what does that mean that when you tell a lie you feel that renewal the renewed conviction when you tell a lie you feel you are uncomfortable you can't go to bed comfortable with that lie when you gossip you feel like something is not right but you see when you are not your heart is not living in a state in a revived state 
it is no more a lie, a gossip, a hatred, a, a care, you know, is no more. You don't even feel the need to repent of it. You can even boldly come before God. You are used to him. Father, in Jesus' name, I'll, I'll now do this. I ask you to do, do. You, you, you don't, are you hearing me? As a heart in a state of revival begins to begins it, it, it becomes conscious to the word of God and you know what happens it, you begin a renewed conviction looks like this this heart begins to you ask yourself you begin to look at how many times God has been gracious to you but you have been and grateful to all those times. And you begin to write down. Ah, I realize how God has been so grateful. I mean gracious to me. Forgiving me. Protecting me. How many times have I come and said thank you. So you begin to repent of the sin. The renewed conviction. What is that? You feel a renewed conviction of, of the sin of ingratitude. Do you understand? How many times people come Lord. I've, I'm sorry. I recognize that I've been ungrateful. I've come to say, Lord, I am guilty of ungratefulness. Lord, let your grace and mercy prevail over me. Because I recognize, let mercy prevail over me in the area of ungratefulness. Are you hearing what I'm saying? That's somebody who's having a renewed conviction. One of the revivalists called Charles Finney. He was in his 40 days of fasting and prayer. And then he entered a factory. And as he entered a factory, there were ladies working on picking up things, um, uh, feeding, you know, feeding um, through this, you know, what do you call them? Um, they were feeding through clothes, you know, cotton factory, yeah. And as he walked, one of the ladies insulted the other with a curse word, a vulgar word. And he looked at them, didn't say anything. When the woman looked at him, she began to cry. She, a conviction of all the sins she has ever committed came upon her. She wasn't born again. She began to weep. As she wept for her sins, she began to apologize to the other one the other one began to cry remembering all her sins how sinful she is began to cry the, it spread the entire factory began to cry and recognized their sin he did not preach a single sermon he was in the state of revival himself and as they stood before him it was as if they were standing before Jesus and a great conviction of sin followed by a strong desire to live in obedience with God fell upon them that they repented and that the 200 souls is it and 40 if I remember vaguely 200 plus that day the entire factory in one day came to the Lord and the owner said eh, also gave his life and said now we want you to come and teach us the bible so the entire 200 plus people being discipled lunch hour fellowship in a factory should we choose to say that the things we desire to see in our generation are actually the reason they seem to be far there is still a message heaven is sending that our hearts have not turned to God a renewed conviction of sin followed by a strong desire to live with God can I show you a heart that is under the state of revival one of the criterion I've shown you you begin to be conscious of the unrepented sins are you hearing what I'm saying unrepented sins sins you push under the carpet let me show you things that you could not now how many do you know a renewed conviction of sin followed by a strong desire to live in obedience with God looks like this you begin to recognize as sin every time 
you have neglected your family altar prayer your family fellowship how many times have you neglected fellowship with your family to pray together and you don't feel it uh, how, how about the neglect the sin of neglect in terms of neglecting your family altar or neglecting prayer but you don't pray you neglect you're not there you don't assemble to the family altar and nothing bothers you it's a renewed conviction of sin the sin of neglect let's look at that one have you been convicted is there a renewed conviction for your prayerlessness or neglect not only of prayer but neglect of reading the word of God you give your attention to everything without reading the word and there's no conviction you don't feel guilty at all for not reading the Bible one day two days a week the neglect of the word how about neglect of fellowship the sin of neglect of fellowship you see a lot of people have learned to rationalize to justify their failure for obedience ah I would just even when they are able to attend I will attend online no matter how much their pastor screams here COVID is over now we can come and fellowship they will not yet they are in direct obedience with the command do not give up fellowship one with another as some have done and they have fallen out of faith hmm? so you the neglect the sin of neglect of prayer neglect of fellowship neglect of the word are you hearing what i'm saying how about the sin of neglect of the spiritual state of other believers this sermon is intended to allow us to plow and give adequate attention to the state of our hearts because revival begins with my heart that's why the psalmist said revive me revive us O god that the city may rejoice in you that my family may rejoice it begins with me a renewed conviction of sin a renewed conviction of sin please revive us not when we call each other we are going to have a three days revival after the three days what's going to happen it's an everyday thing it is a renewed conviction of sin followed by a strong you hear my words followed by a strong desire to live in obedience with this word how do you know you are actually backslidden in the church or in christianity when the word no longer cuts you when it, instead of responding to the word you attack the preacher he's preaching about us why is he one-sided why has he given that example and talking only about men he should uh, only women he should also balance and t t talk about the men if he talks about the men the women the, the men say he should have if he talks about the men he should have spoken as well and balanced it with the women if you're referring to pastors oh he has spoken only the church leaders he should have also balanced it also as sheep we suffer why instead of giving adequate attention to the voice what is god saying to me you sit and you become the word allocator god is talking to someone else the seeds when they are being sown they are coming to the ground of your heart not your neighbor you may live under the same roof husband and wife sleep on the same bed but when it comes to the word of god it does not come to you as a couple it comes to you as an individual we can be a couple but each one of us has the responsibility to prepare the ground of his own heart Christianity or salvation may be all of us are children of God but it is personal personal in how you respond to the word so now when we assess and examine this is examining the state of our hearts God says I try the heart I test the mind and try the heart to reward you see verse 10 says 
He says, I the Lord search the mind, I try the heart, even to give to every man according to his ways. What are the ways of the man? The heart denotes and depicts the ways of the man. What are ways? Character, conduct, and behavior. So your conduct, your character, your attitude and behavior is what reveals your heart. So when God calls us to heart adjustment or purification, he's calling us pay attention to your attitude. How do you respond to correction? The attitude towards correction and rebuke. David says in one of the Psalms 140 what? Is it 43? Psalms 140. He says, let a righteous man rebuke me. I will, not I will not refuse it. Let him strike me, slap me. It is kindness and anointing upon my head. That's King David. He sees correction and rebuke as a kindness and increased increase of anointing. Tell today's generation, who does he think he is to talk to me like that? Why? The heart has become callous, has, be, has been seared has gone to bed and this is the heart that says god move in our generation lord move <laughs> are you hearing what i'm saying to what god is saying to us if we are crying out for a revival it begins consists of the state of the preparation of one's heart are you hearing me revival starts by the preparation of a man's heart are you hearing me? Children of God, are you hearing me? That's where it starts. Thank God. I desired that we would pray more. But he wanted you to know even this is prayer. To pray right. It's not about praying hard. But it is both also praying right. Somebody say, I hear you. I want you to look at a scripture that God uses when God was talking to the Israelites he employed as a great teacher Jesus himself he used to employ he would employ issues pertaining to their career or day-to-day -day life to speak the word so prophet Hosea he employs the language of a farmer to speak to the audience, to relate with the, an audience that understood farming. And he tells them, plow. Read it for yourself. Hosea 10, 12. Are you here? Is the Bible there? If I'm not mistaken, hopefully I'm giving you the right one. He says what? So for yourselves righteousness. You see what he's telling them? You sow for yourselves what? Righteousness. Then what are you going to reap? Steadfast love or mercy. For a man to, for a man to experience righteousness, I mean to experience mercy, God requires him to sow a seed of what? These are seeds you are not told to sow. Sow the seed of righteousness. Then you will reap mercy. Mercy is grace. Mercy is God's favor. Then it's, what does he say here? Suffer yourselves. Right, um, righteousness reap steadfast love. What does God say? Break up your fallow ground. Have you seen it? Break up the fallow ground of your heart. We know our fallow ground is unplowed ground. Ground that has not been what? Unplowed. You can't plant anything into the ground that is unplowed. Are you hearing me? You can't plant anything. You, in the language of farmers, you can't, in the principle of farming, you can't plant a seed in unplowed or fallow ground. Why? It will not bring return. So God wants us. Are you hearing what I'm saying? 
the, what is the ground God is talking about here? The ground of our hearts. Plow your unplowed ground. Then what? Break up your fallow ground. Break it up. What does it say? If for it is time to seek the Lord, uh, that He may come and rain what upon you, uh, that He may come and rain righteousness upon you, that He may come. The rain of revival, the rain of God's glory, cannot come up upon a generation whose hearts have not been plowed. So the breaking of our hearts, breaking the heart, you break the ground of your heart, precedes sowing of seeds and the rain, the response of heaven to rain upon our generation. Do we want it to rain? Do we want it to rain? Do we want it to rain? What is the state of our hearts? Shouldn't we give adequate attention to the state of our hearts? Can we examine the current, the state of the current, of the heart of the, of the state of the, of the, of the heart of the current church? Can I show you why we need a move of God? Why we need a revival? Whenever you see the love of many believers growing cold towards God and each other, we need a revival. A renewed conviction of sin. Please don't think about this revival in an, in, in an old-fashioned or religious way where you think, oh, three days, seven revival, and then what you do? <laughs> People come and fall down. They get up bitter. They get up still angry but they were slain by the spirit but they get up all we have done is to we have done Christian performance performance or what we have done we have conducted Pentecostal foolery lives remain the same are you hearing me it cannot be a revival when drunkards remain drunkards and we say oh God is moving you have been drinking for since you came became born again and you justify it is only wine Jesus said do not be drunk of wine be drunk of Holy Ghost you, you are saying but also wine is good though. are you hearing me and you justify it. Ah, but even Paul told Timothy, drink a little for your stomach. Is your stomach has a problem? Because it was prescribed as medicine. And don't take a one-time revelation. Don't turn a one-time revelation into a denomination. That's why you find people beginning to drink oil. Because they have turned a one-time re revelation into a denomination. That's when you find people wanting handkerchiefs. And then they, ha they have to come and buy hankies. They have turned a one-time revelation into a denomination. So people have become idolaters. They are worshipping things rather than the master himself. Others are into the business of selling olive of this olive oil. So people have lost <laughs> their focus of the master and they are looking at these items. Are you hearing what I'm saying? What happened is because there is need of a revival. How do you know you need a revival? How do we know the church needs a revival? Needs a reawakening. That's what I mean. A reawakening. Do you know how? When there is no brotherly love among Christians. How do you know that the church needs a, a, a reawakening? When the passion for the lost died in the life of a believer. When you, li you live Monday to Monday without witnessing and it doesn't bother you. You backslid. You need a reawakening. You are a, you, the Bible says 
Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be what? You will be my witnesses. Power was given to us to be witnesses of Jesus Christ. Not just to enjoy it. What has happened? The church wants to feel good. We run conferences after conferences talking to ourselves appeasing ourselves encouraging ourselves day in day out encouraging ourselves a backslidden church is not conscious of the master's mission and vision the global vision of god is to win souls and grow them into disciples even the intentionality of discipling our members is not there we are focusing on numbers rather than on making disciples that's a backslidden disoriented deluded church and it is waiting for rapture in its laziness and slumber how do you know the church needs a reawakening when you see brotherly rivalry pastor fighting another pastor church fighting another church competition evil competition among the children of god that's when you know the church needs a reawakening and the church needs a heart surgery and that's what we call a renewed conviction of sin a revival we are talking about are you hearing what I'm saying? When it's all about the money and it's no longer about the souls. It's about the bills of the church, not the souls of the lost. How do you know the church needs a revival? When prayer, when prayer for the believers becomes a taboo and the parties becomes the order of the day when ministries and the churches are run on events but there's absence of prayer intense agonization of prayer the absence of intercession you see you can tell when the church is backslidden the prayers of the saints are shallow and personal not object personal prayer lord increase me prosper me make a way for me my god me prosper me my 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 me 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 i i i and it's not father your kingdom father empower me to meet the needs of my generation father use me as a solution to my generation may i be the answer that you ordained me to the problems of my generation those prayers you don't hear them anymore even when you preach the way I'm preaching, it is annoying some people. Who does he think he is? Why is he talking those things? Why? Because your heart, if you're thinking like that, because you're backslidden. And the dangerous backsliding is when you backslide within the church. Mm. Are you hearing me? It doesn't bother you. You see, the sin of neglect of the spiritual state of other believers. That's how you know you need a revival. Why? I'm trying to show you one sin. Now I've only pointed the sin of neglect. Neglecting the spiritual state of other believers' lives. Can I show you? Today's church doesn't give a toss whether another believer is strong in the Lord whether they are struggling in their faith and walk the bible tells you to empower each other to, are you hearing me hebrews 10 tells you to spar to star one another who do you star who do you stir up and spar towards righteous living when you see your brother and sister messing about you turn them into a gospel 
rather than going to help them to restore them, they become the talk of the city and the town. Why? You have no interest of the master. You are actually in association with the scatterer. Jesus says in Matthew 12, 30, whoever scatters is not with me. Whoever gathers is with me. You became a scatterer. There are those people whose agenda is to scatter ministries, is to scatter churches. There are some of those believers that sit in a congregation. All they do is to ensure nobody joins the church. They don't leave, but they don't allow anybody else to join. When you negatively go talking about where you fellowship and other believers, you, you know what you're doing? You are causing the weak in faith to stumble. And Jesus said, it is better you who causes others to stumble. That are grain, you know, they're grinding, the gr the, what's that? The, 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 what? the millstone should be put around you and be cast in the depth of the sea. Even your body, Jesus doesn't want to see it. So in the case you drown, let them tie a grain. Yeah, you remain at the bottom of the sea. He doesn't even want to see your face. That's how serious Jesus is with those that cause others to stumble. When you are backslidden as a believer, you don't watch your language. Some of you go door to door, house to house to tarnish there are those ignorant believers who think that the weakness and the failure of a man of God gives you license to talk about it. The Bible says in Galatians, oh, be careful about how you restore those who have sinned that you may not find yourself sinning as they have. So other people have sinned more than others who sinned themselves. Why? Are you hearing me? Because when you go spreading the, the failure of another person maybe i was looking at them in a higher esteem next time i can't receive from them because you damaged my perception the enemy used you successfully am i talking to the church we are ex uh, is this this is the state of the current church of jesus christ it can't provoke a move of God until when God says return to me he's talking about our hearts he says render your heart and not your garments what are garments garments in the Bible do not service we can tell this one is a doctor this one is a soldier by reason of a garment they could tell that's a prostitute by the reason of her garment they could tell that's a beggar by the reason of the garment garment do not service god says render your hearts not your services not what you do for him heart he says before you seek me you must plow your heart before you talk about prayer, you must plow the heart. Am I talking to the church today? Is the spirit of the Lord talking to us? If Jesus showed up today, how many of us will be rapture ready? The neglect of, this, of the spiritual state of other believers. When a believer leaves your church, he becomes your enemy. You hate them. You don't greet them. You don't like them. Instead of showing them love to win them over, you hate them. Who told you they became your enemies? The ones that don't fellowship with you, they become your enemies. Most people, when we even pray and say, Lord, as I pray, scatter my enemies. Other people in their mind, their enemies is another believer. God forbid. Are you hearing me? Not a demon. For them, it is, it is the, other, the other one. You f when you find yourself as a believer, rejoicing, rejoicing, rejoicing because of the failures and the struggles of another believer you are demonic in nature you are evil you are wicked wicked 
And you say, Lord, Lord, appear. He says, where? Lord, my heart is available. I said, that one is not available. I close by saying this and I give you time and I give you a, a few minutes to pray. Jesus, we saw him. After he had performed a lot of miracles, signs and wonders, healing many, crowds came following him. And one of the people from the crowd who was a, 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 a scholar of the law, held the law, young man told him, Master, I'll go, I'll follow you wherever you go. Jesus turned and looked at him and told him, Foxes have holes. And the birds of the air have nests. But the son of man has nowhere to what? To lay his own head. What was he saying to him? He was telling him, when I look in you, in your heart, there are all kind of foxes living in you. There are all kind of birds living in you. There's no room for me. You are preoccupied, jam-packed, full of yourself. That's why he told him, go sell everything that you have and give to the poor. The guy went away sorrowful. Why? To prove, if, to validate the fact that there were all kind of birds living in him. Foxes had, in the chambers of his heart, there were chambers for birds, foxes, but there was no room for Jesus. When he said, the son of man has nowhere to lay his head, Jesus was not talking about being homeless. He was talking about this man's state of life. He had no room. So may the Lord, as you pray, I want you now to get up and pray this prayer. Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart, they shall see God. Maybe seat, whatever you are, seated in whatever position, all I want you is to have this realization as you come before God and we all realize as a church because I've only examined one aspect of the sin of neglect and it shows us mm, my God, my God that truly we need God if I was tell, told, if I told you have you ever repented of the sin of, the, of spiritual hypocrisy we would all be guilty spiritual hypocrisy is where you keep repenting of things that you know you are not ready to change you are still going to do them Lord I'm sorry I come before you Lord I'm sorry for lying for fornicating today but you know given the opportunity even tomorrow you're going to do the same thing spiritual hypocrisy repenting of the same things that you know you're going to do again You see, such a teaching is to bring our attention to, to give adequate attention to the state of our hearts. I'll just use five minutes as you go home, as you are in your living rooms, this entire week, this entire month, we have dedicated ourselves till the month of October. We will pray every day five hours as God gives us the grace as we dig deeper because we want God in our generation lift up your voice and say gardener of my heart and don't say the things because I've said them to you say it think about it you're telling him gardener of my heart you are the sower I am the garden I give you the garden of my heart I recognize that I need Plowing. I give you earthly permission in Jesus' name to plow the garden of my heart. Holy Spirit, you are the helper. Help me to overcome the deceits of my own heart. May you be my heart's desire. Let your word be my desire. Let your presence be my heart's desire. Not your anointing, but you yourself, Jehovah God. In the name of Jesus Christ, 
let not your miracles be my desire be you my desire the desire of my heart in the name of Jesus Christ my father my maker be the Lord over my heart I know you are my savior I permit you to be the Lord over my heart in the name of Jesus Christ today I make a conscious choice and decision to circumcise my heart as you have said in Colossians that we should circumcise our hearts I know that the responsibility to circumcise my heart is on me so therefore Lord I choose to circumcise my heart which is getting rid of the vices and the habits and the attitudes that are against your word so Lord I make a conscious choice to forgive my offenders to release those that have offended me and father in Jesus name I recognize your mercy in the area of weaknesses and I realize that I need your mercy my father my maker I come to the throne of grace to receive mercy father in the area of pride I receive your mercy Lord in the name of Jesus my heart has deceived me that I am okay when I am not okay so you the gardener of my heart as I seek you Jehovah God reveal Holy Spirit the dysfunctions in my heart reveal all the contaminations in my heart reveal all the defects in my heart show me where I need to adjust in the name of Jesus Christ the son of the living God you said blessed are the pure in heart that they shall see God I desire to see you in my generation help me Holy Spirit somebody say help me help me Holy Spirit to overcome the vices the habits the attitudes in my own strength that I cannot be able to overcome on my own that's why I need you that's why I need you you are my helper help me Holy Spirit to live a life that will glorify Jesus and bring honor to the Father in the name of Jesus Christ for the remaining days of my life on earth let them bring you glory in the name of Jesus Christ let my my days my remaining days of life be the days to glorify your name in the name of Jesus Christ let my life bring you glory in the name of Jesus Christ purifier of hearts purify my life my life is available spirit of the living God reconfigure my life recalibrate my life renew my life I am available my father in the name of Jesus Christ reveal the deceptions of the enemy and my personal deceptions the ones I've lied to myself in the name of Jesus Christ Jesus said we'll never leave you as an orphan he left you a helper you tell him that's when you rely on the help and tell him help me Holy Spirit to get my heart to sort my heart help me to get my heart right Holy Spirit help me to get my heart right Holy Spirit of the living God Rigadombre Sida Bahanda Radaba Shadi Bahata 
Oh, let the waters of your word flush our hearts. Get rid of everything that is unneeded in our hearts. Oh, master of our hearts, bishop of our souls, our lives available. Oh, spirit of the living God, invade my life. Somebody tell him, invade my life, Holy Ghost. Invade my life, Holy Spirit, invade my life. Set my life in order, set my family in order, set me in order for your own glory, Holy Ghost. Aha. Use those two minutes right now, sa prekiti yo umbra da zanda. Ede shada da do preda da bo shada da bahata. Mande de bo shabra manda da baza da ba. Focus on the Holy Ghost right now. You are my helper, Holy Spirit. I can't live a successful, victorious Christian life without your Holy Spirit. Your help is what I. I need somebody rely on the helper and tell him Jesus said you will help me help me to overcome these weaknesses help me to overcome these vices my attitudes arrogance help me to overcome every ego every self-promotion every arrogance of heart every pride of heart you be honest to him and tell him Holy Ghost help me here this is where I am struggling be honest and tell him you know God is not mad when you tell him that you need help tell him I need help in here I'm struggling here but you can help me I don't want to live like this I want to see your glory in my generation so help me Holy Ghost Uze bremante, ja u presu premanta uze bremanda, more use premanta zibrogusha da barandi, uze bremanta subrega de jando umbre daza. Thank you, blessed Holy Ghost. Thank you, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We honor you. We reverence you, Lord. Spirit of the living God, start a new work of grace in our lives. On this journey of seeking you, may we be found of you. May we see your glory in our generation. May you water us with the waters from heaven as we seek you, Jehovah God, so that our children, our generation may know your power, may know your love, may know you for who you are. In the name of Jesus Christ, Shede Bohumbre de Zata, Jede Mumbra Sadigarumbre de Zigadata, Jenombro Sedibahanda Radabo Shadabahata. Can somebody tell the Lord, repair me wherever I strayed, Lord, repair me. Where I left you, Lord, I return. Where sin damaged my life, Lord, repair me. Where my own rebellion and sin damaged my life, Lord, repair me. Where the enemy damaged my life and prayer life, oh Lord, repair me. Where my fellowship has been damaged by the enemy, Lord, repair me. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. O Sapremanda Zigadusha. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. I said, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for your children. We thank you for this night. And because of what we have heard, we pray that you breathe upon this word. Even for those that shall watch and listen to it over the social media platforms, I pray that this word, Lord, will convict. Let the anointing of conviction the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Let the spirit of conviction fall heavily upon those that shall hear it or even those that are going to hear it again and let it bring transformation and results and tremendous changes. Let there be encounters. Let us hear testimonies that people have started to find you, Jehovah God, and are having encounters, remarkable, tangible, life-transforming encounters in their own lives in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Father, we thank you because we are hidden and protected 
in Christ Jesus us and our families and those that are near and dear to us so father i decree your protection upon every man and woman under the sound of my voice i hereby take divine insurance on their behalf under the blood of jesus christ against every satanic attack or satanic assault no accidents or sicknesses or any demonic maneuvers of any nature in the name of jesus christ and i right now plant the banner of the flag of Jesus Christ over their respective homes and workplaces and I decree and I declare that those places are now governed and controlled by the Lord Jesus Christ himself and all the kingdom activities are what shall take place within those environments and I declare that visions shall be our everyday lifestyle we will hear from you i rebuke every ungodly dream i shut demonic realms and open ourselves to the realm of god to see visions and dreams of god in jesus name there shall be no nightmares in jesus name father we thank you and the believer said amen